Good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, The Problem with Pavement Sealants, How to Avoid Toxic PAHs in Your Waterway and Protect Public Health. Today's webinar is presented by the Alliance of Downriver Watersheds in partnership with the Huron River Watershed Council. My name is Andrea Payne, and I am from the Huron River Watershed Council, and I will be presenting today's webinar along with our suite of panelists including Rebecca Esselman, Watershed Planner and Interim Director from the Huron River Watershed Council, uh, Matt Best, Director of Public Services from Van Buren Township, and John Leon from the Gross Eel Nature and Land Conservancy. We'll start today's webinar by hearing from Rebecca Esselman about the presence and impacts of PAHs in the environment, the regulatory landscape of PAHs nationally and in Michigan, and actions your community can take to reduce PAHs. Two representatives from Downriver Communities, including Matt Best and John Leon, will share what actions their communities have taken to reduce PFAS or PAHs as well. Um, if you have a question at any time during the webinar, uh, please type your question into the chat box on the side panel of the webinar screen. Um, for most of you, it should be on the right-hand side. Your questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. If you have longer questions or comments that you would like to present using your computer or phone audio, please raise your hand and we will unmute you uh, during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Currently, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, um, please feel free to email me at apaine at hrwc.org, or you can use the chat box in the side panel as well. Um, I will now turn it over to Rebecca Esselman to take us through the content of today's webinar. Okay, everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. This is Rebecca Esselman. I've been working on the pavement sealant issue with HRWC um, since 2014, um, and I'm gonna provide you a little overview today. But what I'd like to do first is start with a poll uh, to just gauge everyone's um, exposure to the topic to date. So Andrea is gonna pull up a poll question for you and uh, you'll see a multiple choice answer. Um, submit your answer for me, please. Okay, great. All right, we're seeing them come in. This is good. Looks like a couple more of you have to answer still. Great. All right, thank you. So it looks like a lot of you have some familiarity, uh, but not a lot. Um, we'll work to share more with you today. Okay, so pavement sealants are used to maintain low traffic asphalt surfaces. It's that thin black coating that's commonly painted on driveways, parking lots, trails, and sometimes playgrounds. And it's recommended that they be applied every two to three years. Most sealant products applied by contractors are coal tar based sealants. Far less common but readily available at supplier locations are asphalt based sealants. The sealants contain PAHs, which are a class of naturally occurring chemicals uh, that have human and environmental health impacts. The average pH content of the coal tar based sealants is over 50,000 parts per million, whereas the asphalt based sealants have less than 500 parts per million. So um, you can see there's a pretty dramatic difference, and we refer to the asphalt-based sealants as safer sealant products. So coal tar-based sealants is what we consider a high pH sealant, um, and the asphalt is the safer sealant, and it used to be that simple. 
However, there has been a growing backlash against the coal tar based sealants and manufacturers have developed new products that are not coal tar sealants but are still high PAH. So the landscape on this has gotten a little more complicated in recent years. Uh, you'll see what we have done to avoid the, what we call regrettable substitutes as we have advocated for safer sealing in our work. I'll share more with that, more about that with you in a moment. This figure shows the pathways by which PAHs from sealants end up in our environment. So you can see, and the units here are in parts per million, the dramatic difference differences between asphalt-based sealants and coal tar-based sealants. PAHs weather off the surface that they are applied to. Remember, we recode every two to three years, and that's because they do weather. And they end up in the air, soil, streams, and stormwater system, and also in house dust tracked in on our shoes and pets. There are many sources of PAHs in our environment. There are actually a naturally occurring class of chemicals. However, since discovering the connection between coal tar sealants and elevated PAHs in the environment in Austin, Texas, which was where we first identified the issue back in 2003, researchers everywhere are linking the vast majority of PAHs in our lakes and streams back to a single source, and that's those high PAH pavement sealants. As I mentioned, there's both environmental and human health impacts, and there's also implications for stormwater management. This gives you a high level view of those impacts. When exposed to runoff from coal tar based sealants, fish and invertebrates experience extremely high mortality rates. There's been measured DNA damage and re reduced ability to repair that damage. Um, there's also been links to tumors and behavior changes. Nearly everywhere researchers have looked, they find sediments with high pH concentrations that can be traced back to sealants. And in many cases, the pH levels in those sediments exceed probable effects concentrations, which just means this is the concentration above which we expect to see negative impacts on biota. On the human health front, several pH compounds that occur in high concentrations in coal tar sealants have been found to cause cancer, birth defects, and um, mutations in DNA. Studies suggest increased cancer risk of up to 38 times for people that live adjacent to pavements sealed with coal tar. And there are other human health impacts as well. So much so that in 2016, the Michigan State Medical Society, which is a group of 15,000 physicians, resolved to support state legislative action, restricting the use of these products. They wrote a letter of support for a house bill that was introduced at the time, which would have eliminated the use of high pH sealants throughout the state. Unfortunately, that bill did not see a vote. Finally, on the stormwater front, PAHs from sealants concentrate in stormwater systems, and PAH levels in detention ponds are among the highest. If we, see, if we tested our sediments, we would likely learn they need special disposal and absolutely should not be spread on fields, as is common practice. And in Minnesota, where they are required to test, the cost to municipalities came out in the billions of dollars just for the ponds in the Minnesota, Minneapolis-St. Paul region. This is what helped convince legislators in the state of Minnesota to ban coal tar sealants at the state level. Also in Minnesota, there's currently a lawsuit filed by many of these communities against Coppers, which is the largest supplier of coal tar to the industry because of the cost burden of this contamination. So this is a timeline of action on pavement sealants. You'll see the first municipal ban was adopted by Austin, Texas in 2006. These are, of course, just the highlights. There are new ordinances being adopted every month with a growing number of states represented. Michigan is unique in that we were the first place where ordinances stipulated a PAH content threshold. So all ordinances in Michigan currently require that sealants contain less than 0.1% PAH by weight. 
This is because of that regrettable substitute issue I mentioned earlier. This is to protect citizens and the environment from emerging products that are high in PAHs but are not coal tar based. Because of this emerging issue, Washington, D.C., who previously had a coal tar ban, now has adjusted their ordinance to match ours and sets a PAH threshold as well. So this is the current list of high PAH sealant bans in the state of Michigan. You'll see they're clustered in Southeast Michigan. Because of the advocacy of HRWC and our friends at the Clinton River Watershed and a few other champions in the area like John that you'll hear from later today. In general, throughout the nation, if someone is there telling the story, people are taking action. And we hope to get your community added to this list. I wanted to spend a little time sharing some uh, recent Michigan-based research. So most of our bans were adopted knowing that everywhere people looked, they found PAHs from seal coats at alarming levels. But until recently, there were very few data points actually for Michigan. But in 2017 and 2018, Eagle began investigating in our state. They looked at both stormwater ponds and stream sediments. They tested sealed surfaces to see how widespread uh, coal tar sealant applications were. And in this part of Michigan, they sampled in uh, Novi, Wixom, Ann Arbor, Waterford, Southfield, and Sterling Heights. So to um, gauge how widespread high pH sealants are being used in Michigan, they used this quick field test, which is something you can use in your neighborhood as well. It's actually very cheap, very easy, and quite reliable. Um, there is a link there for instructions on how to do this test. But essentially, if you scrape off the sealed surface, um, you can test um, with paint thinner or some other solvent um, if the um, if you shake that the sealant in the solvent and it turns coffee colored or that dark brown color, it's an asphalt based sealant. If it's the lighter tea colored and it doesn't dissolve, then it is a coal tar based sealant. The alternatives we see emerging that are high pH generally show up similar to a coal tar sealant result, but we definitely need more information on that. So this slide, this table shows um, essentially the take home message here is that when you see sealed pavement, most of the time it's coal tar sealed. So of all of the surfaces they sampled, 90% um, tested positive as coal tar sealed surfaces. This table shows the number of sites sampled by Eagle staff, both stream and detention pond sediments that have high levels of PAHs that exceeded that probable effect concentration I mentioned before. It's what you see in that PAH 16 column. And it also shows the range of concentrations in micrograms per kilogram. The take home here is that when we sample sediments in the majority, of those sediments, we are finding pH is occurring above levels that warrant concern. And sometimes the levels are, in, are incredibly high. So what you're looking at here are pH signatures of coal tar and asphalt-based sealants. And these help us trace pHs back to their source. So what you're looking at here is along the x-axis are individual pH compounds. And it's important to note that the y-axis is not showing concentrations of the different pHs, but rather the proportion of the total pHs that that particular pH occupies. So it means this graphic does not say that pH levels in asphalt-based sealants are near to that of coal tar-based sealants. Instead, what you're looking for here is the pattern. So when we look at the pH profile of a sediment sample, 
and it matches the pattern of the green line, it's matching the pattern of pHs in coal tar sealants. When the pattern matches that of the purple line, it is matching the pattern of pHs in asphalt-based sealants. When we map the pattern of pH proportions in detention basins, we see that they align very closely with the pattern associated with coal tar based sealants and not with asphalt based sealants. This is one of the lines of evidence we use that links pHs in our environment pretty clearly back to the coal tar based sealants. We also see a highly matching signature or pattern in our stream sediments as well. So these are stream sediment samples with the green line being um, the coal tar sealant signature or pattern, and you see they track very closely. So now I'd like to transition to the what you can do portion of the presentation. HRWC picked up on this issue back in 2014. The Clinton River watershed has also been a strong advocate in seeing successes. And I'm thrilled that the ADW is now investing in this issue as well. I will share an overview of our strategy for re reducing pHs in our environment and then turn it over to my colleagues in the Alliance for Down River, of Downriver Watersheds to share why and how their communities took action. After that, we'll circle back to next steps. Essentially, there are three main pillars of a pH reduction strategy. Research is an important one, but one that we have seen EGLE and USGS and other research institutions take a strong lead on. Raising awareness through education and outreach has been an area of investment for us at HRWC. We have different strategies for reaching residents, local and state electeds, and for industry. Jump the gun there. And regulation, as you have seen, is another area we are invested in. It's arguably the single most effective way to see pH reductions in the environment. In fact, in Austin, Texas, where they had the first ban, they sampled sediments 10 years after their ordinance took effect, and they measured a 58% reduction in pHs in the river sediments. So regulations do work to reduce pH levels in our environment. We've been working with municipalities on local ordinances, with state legislators, and the Michigan Environmental Council on state legislation, and we've been working with EGLE on sediment standards and compliance work. We've had the most traction so far on local ordinances, and ideally this will show the will of Michiganders and will result in state-level legislation in the future. Okay, so now I want to take a moment to turn over um, the audio to a couple of your neighbors, um, Matt Best in Van Buren Township and John Leon in Gross Eel. Um, both of these communities have um, taken action on this issue. Um, both have ultimately achieved um, ordinances. And so I'd like each of them to take five minutes to talk about, um, you know, why you uh, took on this issue and, and how it went for you. So Matt, um, I'd like to turn it over to you to start and John will cue you up second. All right, thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> um, my name is Matt Best. I'm the Director of Public Services at Van Buren Township. I'm also the Vice Chair of the Alliance of Downriver Watersheds. And I wanna thank you for having this opportunity to speak today. Uh, the Van Buren Township back in 2015 uh, had a bunch of residents who had been very active in the Huron River Watershed Council and were looking to follow up and bring some local protections for this coal tar thing that they were being told uh, it was important to take care of. Dave Wilson, 
who is a uh, retired uh, professor from Columbia, um, took it upon himself to uh, lead the charge into the Environmental Commission, one of our committees, to eliminate coal tar from products from being used in the township. Um, he brought the, the perspective that he had four objectives for a coal tar ordinance, which is what he ultimately decided to push for. One was to eliminate the cancer risk, especially to children. Two was to rely on citizen education rather than police action for enforcement. Um, educating the public is probably the best way to get people to comply with this. Three, to make sure that contractors were responsible for the contracts they had with homeowners and commercial operators and making sure that they applied the proper product in the community if an ordinance was in place. And finally, to make sure that coal tar based sealers are not sold in the township. So what we ended up doing is our attorney uh, after uh, met with the Van Buren Township Environmental Commission and with um, after talking with some people in Austin, Texas and Washington, D.C., crafted a draft ordinance that was very simple. It, it followed a lot of the things that Austin, uh, Austin, Texas did, but it did something different. It actually labeled and stated that no pavement sealer that contained greater than 0.1% pHs by weight could be applied in the township. And it defined, it clearly defined that. So by doing that, it eliminated this problem that people were having with, well, what bucket do I buy if this, if this company is selling Gem Seal's alternative product that's not coal tar, it still had pHs, this solution was uh, a fantastic one. And then we presented it to our board of trustees and they didn't understand it at all. And that's the, 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 the most difficult thing to this is getting people to understand that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are such a threat and making, under, making them understand that 0.1% ban of uh, banning 0.1% products of 0.1% PAH is, um, is so important. So that's why we, we decided to take, we had our ordinance drafted we worked with Rebecca and the, and the Huron River Watershed Council and our board to host a public education workshop where we invited everybody from the township as well as all the applicators and contractors we could absolutely contact to come to a meeting to discuss the upcoming ordinance and why coal tar sealants are put bad for the environment. And not only did we have the technical aspects being handled by our um, our guest speaker and uh, the um, staff here at the township. We also had residents like Dave Wilson stand up and talk about how they personally could be, uh, be impacted by the, the application of this ordinance. Um, we were very concerned and our residents were very concerned after learning that by applying a sealant, rainwater runoff could pull those PAHs off the, the, uh, the surface to our storm sewers and to our beautiful Lake Belleville. Belleville Lake is in the center uh, of our community and is the, is the driving force of our recreational activities as well as driving up home values in our area because it's such a fantastic natural resource. Being part of the Huron River, it's also um, good for tourism for us because of the Blue Water Trail and Green Trails that are all around it. We didn't want anything to happen to that beautiful resource. And so <clears throat> we pushed forward with the ordinance uh, in, in respect of um, what we were doing there. Um, I guess the best thing that I can say is we passed the ordinance, putting it into um, our board. We had multiple public hearings that uh, people could come and listen and uh, take, care of, uh, take care of their questions. And we even had the Pavement Coatings Technology Council visit us and try to uh, sway us who was against the uh, coal tar bans, the National Conf uh, Council of um, Pavement Coating Technology. They actually tried to convince our board not to pass the ordinance. 
Um, but once we got through that, the toughest thing was, how do we do this? And we came up with three-prong approach. One, public education. We put out pamphlets and uh, literature on our website and mailed pamphlets to residents in the, inside our water bills that talks about the dangers of coal tar and what you can do to uh, avoid coal tar sealants if at all possible. Two, we require that any commercial applicator in the township actually registers with the township and fills out a form that states that they understand that they are not allowed to apply any PAH uh, uh, sealants in the township. And there's, uh, they understand that they have to carry with that form with them wherever they go. Finally, in terms of enforcement, uh, initially we did not have a fine, but following Ann Arbor's direction, uh, we implemented a $10,000 fine. If you are, uh, you have to go to court if you get an, uh, if you get caught without your registration form and you're applying in the township, you need to come back in and apply. If you're caught applying at uh, non-asphalt-based sealants, you'll get a ticket and you have to show up in court. And, and third, if you are applying it and you're caught and you don't go to court, the, it can be a, uh, a serious court, uh, the, the tickets gets jumped up to a, a, a higher level and no one's gone that far, so we're not sure exactly what would happen at that point, but we know it would be bad. Um, how it's worked, we've actually right now have over 55 people who are registered as uh, sealant applicators in the township. Uh, our ordinance officers, if they see anyone applying sealant, ask them for their form. And if they don't have their form with them, they have to take their bill of lading that shows what's in their truck as well as their cells and go sign up at the township immediately or get a ticket. Um, we're here to protect the lake uh, and protect our residents. Uh, we believe that um, education is the best policy right now, the best way to go, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, and with that, I think that's the basics. Uh, you can actually see our uh, coal tar ordinance on our website, and uh, it, it's actually been uh, modified a couple times, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, as we go. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate uh, you sharing that story with us, and I'm excited to hear the number of applicators you have registered. That that was new information for me. John, are you on the line? You ready to take over? Tell us the growth yield yes. story. Yes, I am. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm John Leon. I'm the uh, treasurer for the Growth Yield Nature and Land Conservancy, and uh, following Matt. Uh, presentation. Uh, we had um, a lot of similar uh, situation and um, uh, just to uh, you can see the uh, photo of Grozeal. We are surrounded by water. Everything that uh, the residents or companies do on this island uh, eventually um, could end up in the uh, streams and river. Uh, so in 2016, uh, one of the our past president, uh, Dr. Liz Hugel, uh, brought to our organization uh, the coal tar uh, issue. And um, after much discussion and investigation, the uh, organization decided that uh, we should move forward to start uh, forming an ordinance and uh, trying to get a coal tar ban. Uh, past in Grozeal. Now there had been some previous history in Grozeal with coal tar. Um, the the uh, township itself uh, had um, somewhat, and I say somewhat, banned coal tar on township-owned uh, property. Although that was very um, little understood by anyone um, outside the, the township bureaucracy. We didn't, uh, as a conservancy, we did not know that. Uh, so it was a little bit to our surprise that there, there was a little bit of uh, knowledge there. 
So um, our current president, Peter Kantz, uh, opened up dialogue with the members of the township board while I investigated um, ordinances that were passed uh, in other Michigan cities and townships uh, like Van Buren and Ann Arbor. And eventually what we did was to base our ordinance uh, on, on those two uh, on the township and in the city. So um, after we developed the ordinance, um, we presented this to uh, some of the members of the uh, of our township board of trustees. Uh, we had one minor revision from them uh, that we agreed to, and then we had uh, an open uh, open board meeting for the public. Now, sorry to say, there was there wasn't uh, very much discussion. Uh, by the public, uh, there wasn't very much participation from the public. Uh, there was a vote taken to uh, go forward with the uh, ordinance with two trustees voting against it <coughs> out of seven. And um, the uh, justification for voting uh, against the ordinance was that uh, this ordinance wouldn't be, uh, it would be unenforceable and it would be futile to try to uh, enforce it. Uh, one month later at the next board meeting where the official ordinance was presented, um, the township lawyer made a few changes. Uh, we added the civil infraction that when we made our original uh, ordinance, we did not have, uh, we did not put that in. Uh, we mentioned it, but we left it up to the township to decide the amount. Uh, the board itself had a discussion of the ordinance. So the same two trustees voted against, but the ordinance was adopted. So um, at that meeting, we suggested to the board that a letter be sent out to the seal coding companies to inform them of the ordinance. Uh, we supplied the letter, the names and addresses uh, of the companies, and a letter was sent out. Um, the Conservancy itself created a large uh, yellow postcard informing uh, residents of the new ordinance and uh, the uh, island-wide marketing uh, or mailing, I should say, cost was supplemented with a grant from uh, Freshwater Future. So they helped us out a little bit there. And the postcard uh, the, the title of the postcard was, uh, Can Your Driveway Make You Sick? Uh, so that was sent out to the, the, the 4,000 uh, households on the island. And uh, the Conservancy then also made uh, quite a few presentations to clubs and organizations on the island, uh, specifically about the ordinance, but about the impact of PAHs. Uh, when that happened, there was a lot of talk that began. Uh, people were having a, a greater understanding and were very concerned about this. So as far as as uh, we know, um, we've had a couple of calls from people who uh, were suspicious of uh, some ceiling projects. Uh, when we contacted the uh, owners of the properties, uh, both the owners knew about the ordinance and said that they asked the seal coating companies if they were in compliance. Uh, they, they actually, uh, we, we were surprised at this. They actually asked them for their SDS sheets. So um, the word had gotten out and I, I think that the postcard and these other uh, presentations helped. Um, I did call some of the sealing companies uh, that uh, uh, were involved in, in the uh, suspicious activity and um, talked to them and uh, they were they said they were ready to show us their SDS sheets and and, and they were uh, very aware of the ordinance. So uh, in this happened uh, the, the final the final ordinance happened uh, at the uh, late fall of last year. So uh, we're just basically seeing now uh, 
the now uh, with the seal coating season that has uh, somewhat started, but uh, it's kind of been advanced because of the, of the weather. But um, we uh, will be having test kits. We're going to be making up test kits uh, for our members. Um, the public safety department uh, did not want to have test kits in their vehicles. Um, so we, uh, if we hear or see something uh, and we make a test and it's positive, we will be supplying um, that to the public safety department for further investigation. So uh, that is where we are at the moment. And I really wanted to, to, to thank Matt uh, for all the work that they did and for what uh, you guys have done to uh, help us understand the situation and to uh, give us a base to work with to get uh, this passed in Grozeal. Thanks a lot, John. And thanks you both for sharing your story. Um, you know, as you guys can see, there's several different paths to the same end. Uh, there's different ways that um, ordinances can be implemented and enforced. Um, you know, we've tracked a lot of communities doing this work and can share with you the different options so that you can customize something that works for your community. So what are some of these options for action? Um, on the education front, um, some of your typical vehicles, um, you can write newsletter articles, um, use social media posts, um, host a web page on your website or point to the uh, Huron River Watershed Council's web page on this issue. We have really extensive and up-to-date content on it. We have a brochure. Uh, you see a picture of it there on the screen. Um, we, um, you know, as, as both speakers mentioned, they did um, some brochure distribution to make sure residents were aware of the issue. Um, and so you can do that by having it available at you know public spaces like the library and, and um, city hall, but you can also do direct mailings to your residents. Um, for example, Milford, Hamburg, uh, Belleville, and Van Buren Township, um, as well as Grosseal now I just learned, have done direct mailings to their residents. On the regulatory and policy front, We've talked quite a bit about um, an ordinance to um, prohibit the use of high pH sealants anywhere in the municipality, but there are other options too. You, um, some communities have passed resolutions to voice support for state, state level action with your Michigan legislators. Um, some communities have passed a resolution to commit to using safe sealants on all municipal projects. There's also opportunities to change language in your um, hiring and bidding documents that require contractors use only safe sealant options. Um, the Huron Clinton Metro Park Authority and Washtenaw County have um, implemented some of these policy changes. So they require the use of safe sealants by anyone bidding pavement maintenance work on their properties. And um, as we mentioned before, 16 communities in Michigan have adopted um, um, ordinances to prohibit the use of the high pH sealant. So what we would like to do and are able to do through funding from the ADW is to provide you and your communities support for taking action. So some of the options, some of you know, what does support look like from HRWC? Um, I outlined five things here. So we can come and give presentations to uh, township boards or city councils or environmental commissions, something like that, to um, uh, frame this issue for local elected. We can uh, provide you with an outreach package, which would have uh, content for newsletter articles and a web page for social media posts, things along those lines to help educate your residents. 
We can customize that brochure and facilitate the printing of it. Uh, the cost would come from the community, but we can do all the heavy lifting on the legwork. Um, there, we can provide you with ordinance language, a resolution language, and adoption support. So uh, adoption support is really thinking through um, uh, kind of those different factors that you heard from John and, and Matt. So for example, um, do you want to reach out to pavement sealant companies? Uh, how do you get that list and what should the letter to them read? Um, do you want to um, establish a registration program where applicators need to apply to register um, with the municipality? We can give you uh, draft forms for that. Uh, so uh, we can give you a lot of the um, the content you would need to actually adopt and implement an ordinance. And then we also have language for these policy or request for bid uh, documents too that we can provide. So at this point, uh, we have another poll question for you. And if this question is not applicable to you, say you're a consultant, um, you can just uh, not respond to the question. For those who, while we're answering the poll, I'll just relay that um, uh, after this, we're going to get to next steps and, and Q&A, and we've seen several questions come in through chat, so I'll tackle those first, and then um, uh, we'll see if there's any hands raised as well. Okay, looks like poll responses are in. Thank you. I love to see a lot of you very interested in, in taking action. Um, so uh, we will we will follow up with you. Okay. So um, the 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 next steps um, either today or tomorrow, you're going to receive an email from us that has a copy of this presentation, um, the example brochure, and a brief follow up survey. And that follow up survey will help us know how to best help you. And within a month of this call, I'm planning on, based on those survey results, uh, reaching out to you individually uh, to discuss um, next steps for your community and, and how we can help. Okay, um, and before we shift to questions, I just, I put a, several um, hyperlinks up on the screen to show you where you, there's there's a lot of information that's been curated and a couple of really great sites. The Watershed Council has a site. USGS has a lot of the technical information and research articles for you. Um, the Washington DC Department of Energy and Environment um, has good information as well as the state of Minnesota's Pollution Control Agency. Uh, particularly, they have good information on the implications for stormwater management. Okay, we will now shift over to question and answer. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat or the question boxes on the right-hand side of the webinar screen. Um, our first question is, what is the cost difference between asphalt-based sealants versus coal tar-based sealants? And is it available from contractors? Yeah, so the, the cost is very similar. <clears throat> um, my understanding is that the asphalt based sealants fluctuate a little bit uh, with commodity prices, but in general, they hover around just above or just below the coal tar based. Um, they are available uh, from most, of, most suppliers in our area and actually a growing number of suppliers. I just received a call from a group. Uh, based out of Detroit that only provides the asphalt-based uh, sealant products um, in our region. So it is available to applicators. It's a similar cost. And uh, the other um, story I'll share with you is that we have 
um, made connections with uh, payment sealant companies in the area that have made very viable competitive businesses on the safe sealant alone. So even if there is a little extra cost incurred, they are able to come in with competitive bids and, and win bids and have successful uh, growing businesses. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Our next question is, do asphalt-based sealants last as long as coal tar-based sealants? Sorry, we have a train going by our building right now. <laughs> I'll hold on a second, and then I'll repeat the question. Okay, so the question was, do asphalt-based sealants last as long as coal tar-based sealants? Yeah, so um, this is a question that doesn't have, uh, you know, the, the it's not answered the same depending on who you ask. In general, contractors feel the coal tar sealant performs better than the asphalt-based sealant. Uh, that said, uh, the folks that have switched over to asphalt-based sealants are increasingly satisfied with the performance. And just as the uh, manufacturers are innovating around non-coal tar-based sealants, they're also innovating to improve the performance of the safer sealants. So I kind of liken it to the low flow toilet scenario where the first people that bought those were highly unsatisfied. They just did not perform the same way. But now uh, you can't tell the difference after some years of innovation. But there's you know, still sometimes that lingering stigma that the, the old way is the better way, even though the technology has come along and that they are very competitive from a performance standard. Great. Our next question is, uh, can you provide a list of recommended safe sealants that can be included in specifications? Yeah, I'd like to point you to our website on that. So I maintain a list of safe sealant companies and product lines. Um, this is something, and we, you know, we make it clear on the website that if you're a, a supplier or an applicator and you um, are either supplying or applying the safer alternative, you can call us and get added to that list. And, and I do regularly hear from people that, that want to be added to our kind of approved <laughs> um, or suggested uh, applicator list. Um, so I keep that up to date, and I just added somebody quite recently. So take a look. Um, if you go to hrwc.org slash coltar, it will take you to our website, and you can look for um, the man, uh, suppliers and applicators that do safe sealing. Great. If anyone has any additional questions, um, please type them in at this point or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, but at that point, this is all the questions we have. I'll give you guys just another minute or two for additional questions before we wrap up. Okay, well, thank you all for attending today. Um, feel free to, I put my email address on uh, this slide for you. Feel free to reach out to me directly and look for that survey uh, tomorrow. Please uh, fill that out for us so we know how best to support you. Thanks so much, have a good day.